I'm Kathy Erfer. Uh, I'm River Steward for Connecticut River Conservancy up in Vermont and New Hampshire. Uh, we have a couple folks here, myself, Andrea, and then three of our partners uh, that know more about fish ladders than we do <laughs> joining us. So we'll all introduce ourselves. And then we have a couple slides to share with you to provide a little bit of context. I would say if at any point you have questions, feel free to stick them in the chat um, during when we're showing the slides, just because we can't see you. And then uh, after we're done with those few slides, we can actually just open it up for a conversation. And so you're, you know, feel free to just unmute and ask questions or raise your hand if you'd prefer to. But um, we, you know, want to be able to have a conversation and ask questions as they come up. So again, I'm Kathy Urfer. Uh, this is Cornish Bridge behind me on the Upper River, and you're looking at Mount Escutney there. And I'll pass it over to Andrea to say good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrea Donlin, <coughs> River Steward for the CRC, and behind me is the French King Bridge. Melissa, you want to go? Hi, sure. I'm Melissa Grader. I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the New England Field Office, and I work in the Hydropower Fish Passage Program. Leo? Hi, uh, my name is Lael Will. I am a fisheries biologist with Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. Um, and our department has been monitoring the fish uh, ladders at Vernon, Bellows Falls, and Wilder since their uh, operation back in the mid 80s. And Bill? Good morning. Uh, Bill and David, a contractor with NOAA Fisheries Service uh, based out of Gloucester. And uh, uh, I've been engaged with the relicensing of Northfield Mountain and the Turner's Falls Hydrologic Project. Um, and so, Andrea, if you want to go ahead and share the slides. Okay. Great. Uh, so, um, again, welcome to our, I think this is our fourth or fifth hydropower coffee hour where we're trying to dig into the details on these, the hydro relicensing of these five large facilities. Um, Andrea, what, what picture is here? Uh, which fish, fish ladder is this in this first slide? So the top right is the fish lift at Holyoke and the bottom uh, is the fish ladder at Vernon Dam kind of interesting geometry pattern. <laughs> right, which which I'm sure Lael can explain <laughs> to us why it was designed that way. Um, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. So uh, we have, you know, as you know, there's what we call resident species, which are the fishes that, you know, are born in the river, they live in the river, they grow, grow up in the river, they die in the river. And then we have our migratory species, some of which are born in the river and go out to sea and then come back, some of which go out to sea, <laughs> they're, you know, uh, spawn out there and then those young ones come back. Um, and so just a little bit on the species of concern for the Connecticut River, I'll kind of go over these one by one. Uh, sea lamprey, my favorite, they have a little round sucker mouth with teeth in them. These uh, creatures are uh, spawned in the river in beautiful nests that are made by the adult sea lamprey. They purposefully make a nest in a way so that their uh, amicetes, if I'm using the right term, um, can be caught by the water and like dig into the sediment. And then those young sea lamprey will live in the sediment of our tributary streams uh, all the way up the river, uh, you know, well, well past kind of Brattleboro um, for seven to 12 ish years and then they become they start to uh continue to grow become adults and then they head out to sea and they live their adult life in the sea uh clamping on to fish in the ocean uh, when they're ready to reproduce they head up river again and when they're coming back up river in the connecticut river they um are you know going blind they stop feeding and their sole purpose is to spawn. And then after they spawn, they die. So they're bringing a lot of nutrients up from the ocean. Oh, Andrea, can you go back again? Is 
Sorry, it's not moving back up. Um, hold on. Or maybe if you stop, you could stop I might sharing. Have to stop sharing. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the other one. So American eel is is uh, a species. So the sea lamprey has a little sucker mouth. The American eel, also kind of looking like a snake-ish, um, lives in the river most of its life and actually migrates out to the sea to spawn. And then the small glass eels make this epic journey from the Sargasso Sea up into the rivers and they change form as they come up the river. So they get a little bit bigger, they're yellow, they get a little bit bigger, they're, they're black, and then they become silver eels as adults in the river. Um, and these, both sea lamprey and American eel have a very large extent. They come, uh, you know, quite a distance up the river and always have. The American shad, uh, it's believed, it would only migrate up to kind of where the Bellows Falls dam is now, where the Bellows Falls actually, um, they couldn't really get past that. And so American shad ideally could spawn possibly up to three years in a row. They, um, you know, so in a best case scenario, they would come up, spawn, go back out into the ocean, come again the following year and do that, do that three times. The, the, because of the need to move through the facilities, our shad are a little bit exhausted. And I think for the most part, they make it once, sometimes they make it twice. And so, you know, one of the hopes is to um, increase their reproductive health really. River herring uh, at the moment are uh, migrating up in the lower part of the estuary. And so there's a lot more fish passage provided for river, river herring in the, the lowest tributaries. Um, and I believe that they used to come up this way, but you know, I'll leave that to the fisheries biologist to clarify. And then um, Lael, I think also we'll maybe talk a little bit about there's resident fish in the river that would ideally like to move around more when they're spawning. They would like more access to the river. And so that's another one of the goals. So I'll pass it off to Andrea to go to the next slide and talk a little bit about, about numbers. All right, so I'm going to give a very, oh, my, weird, my screen is locking again. Hmm. Do you want, right. oh, um, All right, so I'm going to go through the first three dams on the river, just briefly what's there now. Um, and this is traditionally shad um, basically migrate up to the Bellows Falls Dam. So these are the three main dams um, that uh, currently have fish pad. The other two um, upstream dams will go over that in a bit. Um, but so Holyoke has uh, two fish lifts in place and seasonal, seasonal eel ladders. And um, this dam went through relicensing in the, around the year 2000. Some modifications were made to the fish lifts. Um, um, the eel ladders were required and there were years and years of fiddling around with that. Um, now they're passing thousands of eels per year. And, um, there's also, as of a few years ago, um, short nose sturgeon pas passage up and down. Turner's Falls has um, fish ladders right now in two places. The one in the picture shows the fish ladder at the base of the dam. There's also a fish ladder at the end of the power canal. And then there's a third ladder that both fish, you know, both routes have to use to get from the basically the top of the canal into the river above the dam. That's called the gatehouse ladder. And um, at Vernon, there's a fish ladder that passes fish. The Turner's Falls and Vernon don't have um, eel passage in place. There was some testing done um, during the relicensing studies. And I don't know, I think last year, maybe Great River Hydro 
voluntarily pass some eels, but their license don't don't yet require that. Well, the the fish ladders themselves will you know eels will use them. There's questions about how effective they are um, at passing eels. So there's no eel specific fish way at the dam, but they do use the ladders and they use it at fellows as well. Okay. Um, so right now, sort of the performance uh, of these Holyoke passes, maybe, um, you know, 200,000 to half a million shad per, per season. Um, and then passage is not so good at Turner's Falls and Vernon is pretty good. It passes most of what passes at Turner's Falls. Um, but we'd really like there to be better numbers going up Turner's Falls. Um, and what's proposed in the new license is that they would put a fish lift in at the base of the dam, um, which would be sort of Holyoke style. It wouldn't look exactly like it, but, um, and there, there's going to be more water in the um, section of the river that's currently bypassed by the canal. And then they'll put in, um, they're proposing to put in ultrasound, which would repel fish at Cabot. Um, and then there will be eel passage. So I think um, one thing that isn't stated in the license application is just what happens if that passage performance um, or that plan doesn't pass enough fish. And um, so it may be that the fish ladder that's there at the base of Cabot or a fish lift would have to be installed at some point. Um, so there is a fish ladder at Bellows Falls and these are some pictures of it. Um, I think currently what it passes sea lamprey and Lael, well, maybe you could help me <laughs> on this. What? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so what happened with Bellows Falls is the, the trigger was um, Atlantic salmon. So we had to talk to the hydro company and negotiate with them to have some sort of trigger <clears throat> to actually operate Bellows Falls ladder. Um, and that trigger is based off of sea lamprey passing at Vernon. <clears throat> so for right now, until we get the new license, um, the main goal is to get uh, those sea lamprey past uh, Bellows Falls because they tend to move up into the White River, which is downstream of Wilder um, to spawn. We have a, a big spawning concentration in the White River. Similar to Vernon, um, American eel will also use Bellows, but what we see is what we call a lot of fallback, meaning the fish will pass to a certain point and then fall back. Um, so we're not entirely sure, you know, how effective uh, Bellows Falls is at, is at passing um, eel. So we'll be looking at that more and then also, you know, making modifications or installing an eel ramp to better pass eel. But for right now, the focus is to operate that ladder to pass um, sea lamprey. Other species like we see a lot of tr some trout in there. We see some bass in there also using it. Um, the, the other thing with Bellows is that they have a, a nature center there. So it's really good for the public to be able to go over there and see, you know, fish using that ladder. Um, so a lot of times with that trigger that I'd mentioned for sea lamprey, they end up opening Bellows Falls more or less for that nature center because they have events going on. Um, okay. And I sort of skipped over Vernon in terms of um, Shad Passage has been pretty good. There were some modifications that got made at the turn recently. Um, so I think, I don't know if Lael, you have. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, that desired. Yeah, so what we found out during some of the um, relicensing studies, there's an 80 degree turn um, at Vernon and it was creating this back eddy and the shad were getting turned around. So we tried to eliminate that back eddy by installing uh, what we call a partition wall um, to keep them moving along. Um, so that modification was done last year. You know, folks know that there was that drought year. We had a low tailwater. Um, and so we're gonna be talking to the hydro about that. Um, that low tailwater really impacted the ability, what we think 
uh, impacted the ability of the fish to get into the ladder. Um, so numbers last year were down and we think it was because of that tailwater elevation wasn't high enough because of the drought. Okay. And then going on to Wilder, um, is this open every year? Is it just, or this, So just again, open? when the, the salmon program ended um, in 2013, we didn't have a trigger to operate Wilder. Um, we don't, during the FERC studies that we did for upstream fish passage, we didn't see sea lamprey really using um, Wilder. That's probably because they're, you know, the pheromones just aren't there to keep them moving, right? So we had a couple sea lamprey um, use the ladder, but we, it just wasn't justifiable to have them um, operate that ladder for, you know, one or two sea lamprey. It will be opened um, <clears throat> early under the new license. We have negotiated to operate all three ladders earlier in the season for those resident species, uh, white sucker and walleye that tend to make those early spring spawning uh, migration. So under the new license, it will be operational um, come April 1 or whenever they can get it um, running. And so from there, we'll monitor it, but it has not been operational in several years now. I think, I think I want to say 2013 was the last year it was, it was open. Okay, thanks. Um, and then I have a couple of slides that we can come back to if people want to talk a little bit more. This is just a basic um, conceptual drawing of what a fish lift is and looks like. Um, and then I also have uh, also a schematic um, which is not like an official drawing of what's going to be where, but um, this is roughly what kind of where a fish lift would go at Turner's Falls. Um, you can see these dashed lines here. These are the bascule gates at the um, one half of the, the Turner's Falls Dam. And then this black surface here is the gatehouse. And so the, a fish lift would be um, put in right around here. There'd be water that would be supplied to as attraction water. AWS is what attraction water supply? Auxiliary water system. Okay. <laughs> okay. I was totally wrong. <laughs> um, Same thing. And, <laughs> good thing we have people who know what they're talking about. Um, and uh, so then the fish would get lifted and then moved over to the gatehouse um, area where there's already passage and then use this final um, existing ladder structure to pass into the impoundment. Um, there's also going to be kind of a little mini blockage here, which would create a pool of water, um, which is more for downstream passage. But I don't know whether it would also help, you know, kind of funnel the fish in the direction of the, the lift area during the upstream passage season. Um, and that is all we wanted to share at the moment. I'm happy to bring any of those slides back up if people have specific questions. Um, the Turner's Falls lift, this, the drawing that was submitted as part of the application um, is not a public document because um, anything that contains uh, specific drawings of infrastructure is protected um, as critical infrastructure. So that drawing I showed you was just a sort of a cartoon schematic. So um, Todd put a question in the chat. So maybe we can address that first, but then I would invite anybody to ask any questions. You know, this is, you know, where the, there's some assumed knowledge here, even with Lael, with if when Lael says there were no pheromones, right? Like <laughs> maybe that needs to be explained for some folks. So feel free to ask anything. 
about this or the relicensing in general. So, um, Lael, this is probably for you. Todd was asking relatively these three fish ladders, and I think we were talking about Vernon Bellows and Wilder work to some extent. Other configurations elsewhere don't work as well. Eddies and tailwaters are the controlling factors. That's a question. And are there any other controlling factors? Any other factors in terms of what, of, of their effectiveness? Yeah, I think so. Todd, maybe do you want to clarify? I just want to make sure I understand the question. Yes, Lael, any other controlling factors on the effectiveness? Thank you. Uh, so, you know, each species is different in terms of their swimming capabilities, their ability to leap. So, you know, Atlantic salmon, um, these fish ladders were primarily designed for salmon, which tend to be good leapers and super, super strong. So, you know, it's, it's really, you know, the fish passage engineer will go in and take a look at, you know, velocities and, and stuff like that to make sure that there's no velocity barriers. There were some tweaks back in 2012 made for, um, the Vernon fish ladder for that leaping capability to get out of the ladder. So they had to drop it down um, some of these flashboards that were there um, so that the fish could leap through. So it's very tricky when you're trying to, you know, you have this very expensive ladder that was designed for one species, but we know, you know, these species all move differently and have different capabilities. So that's why, you know, eel are different than salmon. So we're trying to work that out to make sure that eel are accommodated for. Um, but overall, I think, you know, the Vernon ladder has proven to be fairly effective for shad. Um, Thanks, Leila Kathy. Yeah, and at this point, I'd say the, the, the main, the main obstacle, well, they're all obstacles. Um, you know, the least effective ladders are the ones around Turner's Falls. So those are really need to be addressed. And obviously, as Lael mentioned, they're, they're become triggers, right? So unless we're really getting good passage at Turner's Falls, it, there's not the kind of incentive uh, there to make sure that the other ladder, ladders further upstream are functioning to the best of their ability. Lael, I had a question about, um, so, if Wilder is going to be open some for the resident fish, you said beginning April 1st, how long will that ladder be open? And then does, will it overlap with when the sea lamprey are moving? So, mm -hmm. and is there any possible plan to start to, um, you know, build the, the pheromones really like, you know, build more sea lamprey spawning above that to sort of have those young creatures attract <laughs> more adults? Yeah, so so your first question, the end date right now is July 15th. Um, and so that would accommodate uh, the sea lamprey run. Um, in terms of, you know, if they volitionally want to start moving up, obviously we would, you know, support that. Um, we have our craft sea lamprey management plan and we're phasing through right now uh, different objectives and strategies with that. And so what we're trying to do right now is get a better handle on current distribution. Um, and I think from there, you know, at some point we may decide to, you know, habitat isn't limited. We don't feel like, we don't feel like there's enough sea lamprey actually passing Bellows Falls to have some sort of, you know, density dependent competition or anything like that. Um, but there has been, you know, talks about potentially in the future of doing, you know, transplanting above. Um, we would just want to make sure that whatever goes above, number one, that there's available habitat for them, and number two, that they can get back out safely. So downstream passage is, you know, needs to be looked at. Yeah, and that, <laughs> maybe not so much for for the for the amicetes or the juveniles. I think there's been some work, but you know, it would need to be operational. We wouldn't want them to go through the turbines necessarily. Yeah, I was that's also way, that's way down the line. Um, I was gonna uh, ask about if you 
all would want to talk a little bit about downstream passage. We're sort of focusing on upstream passage, but we should probably talk about the downstream passage considerations as well. And just before I pass that question over, I, I also want to say that um, CRC has started a community science program where we're actually going out into the tributary streams and surveying for sea lamprey nests. And so if that's something you want to get your literally get your feet wet and help us with that, you can sign up through our website, but, but we'll be checking a lot of the streams um, to sort of try to identify habitats, find sea lamprey nests, measure them. It's fun. I did it last year. It was so cool. Kathy, we do have a question in the chat um, from Laurel about how the how are the salmon doing? There are none. <laughs> They're going to Connecticut, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the salmon program stopped a number of years ago. Uh, the state of Connecticut maintains a legacy program and they do some, they have their own hatchery program. They stock out uh, fry and smolts, I think, maybe into several tributaries. I think the Farmington, Salmon and Eight Mile. Uh, but other than that, uh, if any adult returns come up beyond Connecticut into Massachusetts, um, they, they would be passed. Um, they, they have uh, volitional passage wherever there is passage operating. So they would be able to come back uh, and, and move about the watershed if, uh, if they wanted to, so. Yeah, and we haven't seen any adults in several, I only wanna say like three years now. Yeah, nothing, no salmon has passed at Holyoke this year. I don't know. I think there have been a couple here and there over the past few years. But I don't know what last year was like. Yeah, and there's still, I mean, I think that puts more um, hmm, pressure, importance. I don't know, as you think of the rivers that are north of us that att attach to the sea, like the Penobscot and the rivers in Maine, where there's still are salmon moving, um, it, it makes it even more important that, that those are functional. Um, another question is, you know, which I find sort of fascinating is the jurisdictional difference. So maybe Bill and Melissa, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the difference between US Fish and Wildlife Service, what you cover in this relicensing and as opposed to NOAA and what NOAA needs to pay attention to? Sure. Uh, yeah, so NOAA Fisheries is, is largely focused on the on, on the species you had in your your uh, slide. Or the, the, that was an Andrea slide. So the sea, sea lamprey, American eel, American shad, uh, and river herring, i.e., blueback herring, and, and alewife. And uh, alewife really don't go north of the the Connecticut border in, in, in any meaningful numbers. Um, so the, 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 those are the four species we, we've been focused on, um, and it's the same species we're focused on in the. The Farmington and uh, the Shreyla. Um, we, we, we've identified some some good habitat there, good tributary habitat. So it's, it's kind of those four species: uh, fish passage and flows. Uh, we're also involved in um, listed short-nosed sturgeon. Uh, it's one of the few rivers, I guess. I think also on the Penobscot now, but uh, there aren't too many rivers where short-nosed sturgeon are passed. But the Holyoke Project is one. So uh, Holyoke Gas and Electric has to engage in Section 7 consultations, and they need a take permit. And uh, the, any surgeons that are passed there, they need to do it you know, safely, and they can't harm or harass the, the, the animals. And then at Turner's Falls, we know that there's uh, short no surgeon spawning, uh, sort, of, sort of a stone's throw, if you will, from the Cabot Station powerhouse. There, there are some shoals there. Uh, Micah Kiefer's done a, a ton of research there. And then just a little bit further upstream at, at Rock Dam, we also know that that's a surgeon spawning site. So my, my colleague, Julie Crocker, is, is really kind of the lead for, for all the uh, Endangered Species Act uh, consultations and coordination with, with, with short-nosed sturgeon. And then as, uh, as we go through relicensing, uh, the one thing that's come out of it is the importance of uh, flows on the bypass channel uh, for American shad that are trying to make it to the dam and for uh, the, the listed surgeon that that spawn there. So we've, uh, as we've gone through relicensing, we, we've worked on some uh, pretty significant changes to, to the bypass or the, the the flow regime down the bypass channel. The amount of water that's released from the dam and uh, water from from station one, which is a smaller powerhouse, 
sort of sort of roughly midway, not exactly, but sort of that, that provides water back to the bypass channel. Yeah. Um, in addition to what Bill said, I'm not sure if this is what your question was, Kathy, but both the service uh, NIMPS and the Fish and Wildlife Service are um, involved in the Turner's Falls relicensing, um, but just the Fish and Wildlife Service is involved in Great River Hydro's relicensings. And that's just a decision that's made, you know, within um, our respective agencies where our workload and participation is, is best used. Um, <clears throat> and we have our, we, we are involved in these projects because uh, among other things, our, you know, trust resources are involved. We have interests in enhancing aquatic connectivity for our trust species, which includes interjurisdictional fish, the migratory species we've been discussing. Um, and we have uh, authority under Section 18 of the Federal Power Act to prescribe fish passage facilities. Um, and so that is one of the reasons that we're involved in these relicensings. And with respect to downstream passage, uh, currently, you know, uh, Wilder, Bellows, Vernon, Turner's Falls, and Holyoke all have downstream fish passage. Uh, as part of the relicensing for these um, projects, uh, First Lights, Turner's Falls, and Great River Hydros, Vernon, Wilder, and Bellows, they did a number of studies, and those studies identified that, you know, there is room for improvement to um, enhance passage and protection for these species as they uh, leave the freshwater environment and go out to the ocean. Um, and so we are um, working towards that end. Yeah, and right now, um, in terms of Bellows and Wilder, there's a trigger um, for downstream passage, which is based on salmon. So we had to tweak that a, a little bit as well. So it's, it's if 50 salmon pass, that's what the trigger is for downstream measures. So currently right now, um, Wilder and Bellows, you know, they're not gonna meet that trigger. So there's no downstream, the facilities are there, they're just not being operated. Um, but Vernon is operated for the shad, both the uh, adults and the uh, um, juveniles. Thank you. Does anyone have a specific question about upstream, downstream? I I do. Uh -huh. um, I'm I'm just learning this, and so it's really interesting. But so. Leo, you said the downstream passage isn't operating. Does that mean there the bypass flow, there is no bypass flow for fish passage at those dams or, or what does that mean? Um, so, so Bellows Falls has a bypass channel. So they divert a portion of the, most of the water <clears throat> to go into a canal that then goes through um, the turbines. And so there is a louver there to try and get fish to not go down the canal, but unless, and Melissa, correct, correct me um, if I'm wrong, um, during high flow events, anything over about roughly 10,000 CFS, that's when the Bellows Falls bypass will start to spill. Um, and so fish would be able to utilize that bypass system, uh, or not system, but that bypass channel if they were to spill. Now, whether or not they incur injuries during that, we haven't really looked at that. Um, but there are measures in place to try and keep them from trying to get entrained or impinged um, at the head of the canal. Um, and then Wilder, you know, doesn't have a bypass channel. Everything's outfitted on the, the main stem of the river. Um, so without having, you know, the pipe operational or the bypass system operational, you know, most fish would, would probably go through the turbines. Okay. Melissa, did you want to add any details to that? I'm trying to- Well, just, my just to numbers. clarify, yeah, the, the term bypass can be confusing. So there's the bypass reach. And as Leo said, only Bellows Falls has really a bypass reach on, and Turner's Falls, but I mean of Great River Hydro's projects. And when we talk about a fish bypass, we are referring to bypassing them around the um, turbines to avoid them having to pass through the turbines and potentially incur injury or mortality. Thank you, that's helpful. Yeah, sorry. And just to further clarify, 
we refer to these areas around Bellows Falls and Turner's Falls as the bypass reach, but that's actually the river mm -hmm. that has been dewatered because all of the water is going through a canal. So both Bellows Falls and Turner's has canals mm -hmm. where all the water is going. Um, and so that's, you know, that becomes part of the complicated the, the, the complication for those particular facilities. The other facilities, you know, Vern, uh, Vernon and Wilder, the dam is in the middle of the river, right? And so the water is flowing either through the dam or over the dam one way or another. There isn't like another area where the water is being taken like a pipe or a canal, so. So Todd asks, what's the general fish mortality rate through turbines and does it vary by species? It does, it varies by species and by life stage. So um, in general, the um, probability of a, a turbine blade strike, which is one of the primary means of incurring injury or mortality, um, has a direct relationship to the length of the fish, uh, the size of the fish. So uh, young fish, uh, juveniles uh, and smaller fish tend to have um, less injury and mortality than larger fish um, and, and longer fish. For example, eels, in most cases, uh, are one of the species that can be <clears throat> um, most impacted by uh, turbine blade strikes. Uh, so I don't know. And then it depends on the type of turbine, right? So uh, it, it, you know, different turbines uh, are. Each turbine is a different size. It rotates at a different speed, and all of these um, and operate at a different head and over a you know wider range of flows. And all of those um, influence uh, how likely it is that a fish will get injured or killed going through it. So it, it's complicated, um, but there are ways, both you know empirically through field studies and indirectly. Um, through uh, these analysis tools to, to get an idea of what that um, likelihood of injury and or mortality would be. And Lael and Bill, if you wanna add to that, please do. And the probability of them actually getting entrained. So, you know, maybe the younger, smaller body fish, they do well in the turbines, but they're more likely to be, to get entrained. You know, they just don't have the swimming capability. So that's stuff that we look at, trash rack spacing, approach velocities so those fish don't get entrained and impinged. That's the only thing I wanted to add. You want to just um, <clears throat> cover what those two words mean, entrained and impinged, briefly. Yeah, so entrained means that they, they're riding the train to the turbine. <laughs> uh -huh. Means they pass through the trash racks and then impinged would be that they are actually impinged or stuck against the trash racks. And so if the velocity of the water going through the racks is too high and exceeds the swimming ability of that species or life stage, it eventually will tire. And if it's too small, too big to fit through the racks, it'll just kind of get stuck on the racks and then eventually die. Well, one protective measure that, that's used at some projects, but by no means all, but just it's a protective measure that's out there is this, it's called nighttime shutdowns. The idea is that the hydro, the hydro operator ceases to spin a turbine, ceases to generate electricity from to, say sundown to, to sunup. And that, that's typically a protective measure for, for downstream migrating eels. Uh, again, it's not used everywhere, but we've, we've seen that at, 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 at several projects throughout New England now. Because the eels move at night? Yep. yep. Well, the, 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 to suggest that they move throughout the day, but maybe the, the, the bulk of the migration is at night. And so that's why some of the resource agencies have required the shutdown to occur at night as, as opposed to 24 hours a day. So Eve asked, how much improvement is expected at Turner's with the new fish lift? Will, and is it designed to help all species? I would say, I mean, oh, sorry, hold on. Oh, I thought I was muted. Definitely one of the benefits of a fish lift, which is non-volitional, right? You have to have somebody there, you know, pushing a button, operating the lift, or it can be automated, um, is that it passes typically a wider range of species than some of these other um, pool and weir type ladders. Um, so 
that could be a benefit. Um, one of the disadvantages is that it's, you know, not considered volitional and, you know, we like uh, to be able to have the fish move when they want. Um, and so uh, that could be a little bit limiting in a fish lift type operation. Uh, but in general, the expectation is that with a new fishway um, at Spillway at Turner's Falls, um, built with, you know, to current Fish and Wildlife Service design standards using, you know, state of the art, um, best practices um, and lessons learned from other facilities, you know, the, the hope is that it would be much, much more efficient than either of the existing ladders at Turner's Falls. And Turner's Falls was originally designed mostly with salmon in mind? Melissa? Probably, but I can't say for certain. Uh, actually, I mean, it could have been for salmon and for shad. And Steve Leach is on the call. Steve, if you know for sure, please weigh in. Sure. Um, and, and I guess I'll, I'll take a second to introduce myself if I can. And sure. I'm Steve Leach. I work with First Light Power for the past couple of years, but I've been on the Connecticut River for 17 or so, and I've been doing fish passage for 20 or so. And I've been 25 or so and, and shed biology for 30 or so. Um, and, and, and I'll give myself this plug. I think I might be the only person on this call who's physically boots on the ground worked at every one of these facilities in Fish Passage. Um, and so to the question, shad were mentioned, but the design really was for salmon and it was adopted. So this is becoming very technical, but the, the, fish, the fish ladder designs on the Connecticut River are either modified ice harbor or vertical slot. So that picture that Lael showed of, of uh, Vernon is vertical slot, and that's, that's half of the ladder there. The modified ice harbor refers specifically to a Columbia River facility in Washington. And I think that the lesson learned all these years later is scaling down a facility of that size didn't work for shad. It actually worked fairly well for salmon moving upstream. Right. So thank, thank well, you. but it did. It does work at Vernon, so it's not quite as straightforward. It doesn't, for sure. You know, uh, didn't work at Rainbow. Right. It, <laughs> it does. At the, and, and the vertical slot dum, uh, sizing down didn't work at Rainbow, and the Ice Harbor uh, sizing down at Turner's didn't work. But Vernon, which is a hybrid right and it's half serpentine half ice harbor for whatever reason it seems to work <laughs> yeah and and there's there's lots of different hydraulic reasons that brett taller would be the, the person to talk to but uh salmon are okay with what's called plunging flows so when the flow goes over one of the baffles and if it doesn't look nice and smooth like water going over a rock uh you know a submerged rock then it's confusing to shed because there's a back current uh, whereas salmon didn't have such an issue with that. And, and then I, and I believe this is true of Vernon as well, except that there's only one big turn pool at Vernon, uh, but the big turn pools have been a problem. For Shad, for sure, yep. Mm -hmm. And, you know, during relicensing, the question came up about, well, couldn't you just make the ladders at Turner's Falls better? Um, and I think one problem is they really weren't designed to pass hundreds of thousands of fish um, the way we would want that number to be passing. And then, um, you know, with a fish lift being proposed at the dam, the, the emphasis was on not having passage through the power canal because that was shown to be, um, I guess I don't want to. I guess a waste of time because they or energy because the there was a um, one of the studies showed that Shad on average spent uh, multiple days, maybe a week, in the canal. I don't know what they were doing, but you want to be able to pass them quickly as possible so they can get to good spawning habitat. And that, that's fair to say and, and public to say is that uh, 
passage into the canal has been problematic in, in over many studies uh, over several years and not just relicensing studies that uh, fish either fail to ascend the canal or fail to locate and pass gatehouse after ascending the canal. Uh, so part of the purpose for the proposal is to bypass the canal in terms of upstream passage. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there it, it, it introduced yet another point of of delay um, and potential passage uh, problems if the you know gatehouse itself, the gatehouse ladder, had uh, efficiency issues. And so, the more elements there are or nodes there are that the fish need to negotiate in getting from point A to point B, you know, the more the higher the likelihood that cumulatively they'll add up to you know an overall. Mm, potentially poor passage performance, right? Efficiency of that facility. Um, and so that is yet another reason to try to have it be more direct. Um, they get up to the spillway, they, there's, well, there's still two because they have to go um, to the gatehouse, out the gatehouse ladder too, which has proven to be very effective. Um, of all the elements there at Turner's Falls, I think that has the high, highest efficiency is that exit ladder um, out of gatehouse. So, um, I think that is is going to be a benefit. Our engineers um, looked at the the existing ladders, and I believe their assessment was, yeah, you might be able to do some minor tweaks to you know get an incremental gain in efficiency of a few percentage points. But in really, in order to make substantial improvements, you'd have to you know rebuild the entire ladder, and if you're going to do that why not just build a lift because you know passes a wider suite of species there's with shad you know there wouldn't be hopefully not turn pools hopefully not or or that there are um, uh, fewer turn pools that they would have to negotiate and therefore your overall uh, efficiency um, would be much higher and then in terms of will it help all species um, you know I think that if river herring make it up in sizable numbers to Turner's Falls, they would pass with the lift. So would um, sea lamprey and, and chat, obviously the eels uh, because of the way they, you know, wriggle up a wetted surface. They often have different um, eel ramps, but eels do pass upstream in smaller numbers at Holyoke. Um, so I think that's, it will help those species. And then um, there are resident fish that move up and down um, Turner's Falls now, and also uh, the fish left at Holyoke. And then the other half of Eve's question was, um, does First Light also need a take permit under the Endangered Species Act? Does that trigger a biological opinion? Um, Bill or Melissa? You want to answer that one? Yes, yeah, so we're we're still waiting for information. Uh, FERC has not issued a, a ready for environmental analysis. That that's a bit a fairly large milestone event in the relicensing process. It means FERC has all the information that they need to uh, to write their their National Environmental Policy Act document, which is typically an environmental assessment, um, and then for the section for the ESA consultation. There needs to be a biological uh, assessment that is turned in, and that the the NEPA document typically serves as that assessment. Not always, but that's what we've seen lately. And then finally, uh, NIMS turns that around and issues a a biological opinion. So that's that's still down the road. My guess, again, my my, my colleague Julie Crocker really is. This is really more her her, her bailiwick. But uh, Steve, correct me, but I suspect we'd probably get a biological opinion in 2022 if that seems reasonable but um i think that's kind of the the, the time frame yeah and, and i think you mentioned it but the yeah the biological assessment um of course comes a lot quicker than than the biological opinion does yep exactly so that but yeah that, that, that's kind of the process uh biological assessment from either FERC or the licensee and then NIMS or the or the consulting the lead agency in this case NIMS for for short nose surgeon 
uh, the biological opinion will, will come out. And uh, as far as a, a take permit, um, actually at Turnos Falls, I don't, I don't think they'll need one because it's just, it's simply their, their spawning grounds. Um, so yeah. I think, um, th and this is, I, I won't speak to, you know, anything ongoing with relicensing, but just from a history of having worked on short nose sturgeon and, and biological opinions and so forth, that um, what we know now, or at least what, what the history says is that sturgeon don't pass through the spillway uh, ladder. And so at the moment, we're assuming that will also be true of the fish lift. However, we expect as part of the, at least the biological assessment, probably the bio biological opinion in the end, that we will have a handling plan. And that's pretty common. So if you have a facility that's not intended to pass sturgeon, but you do, then you have a plan that's enacted with how to handle that. Yeah, good, good, good point. I mean, just as one example, there's uh, several of the first dams in Maine. So Cataract, first dam on the Saco, uh, Brunswick, first dam on the Androscoggin, Lockwood, first dam on the Kennebec. The, all those projects have uh, certain handling plans. They're, they're, they're not supposed to pass them, but sort of as Steve alluded to, if, if they do show up, um, the, the companies or the licensees do have a, a handling plan for, for, for in, the, in the occasional or low likelihood that, that one of the animals does show up. I mean, these are not everyday occurrences, like maybe one every three or four years or five or something, you know, but in, in that event, there's a plan for, for handling it, these animals. Um, there was a question, uh, Leslie was asking, where's the nearest place in Connecticut around Colchester to see a fish ladder or other fishway? And then um, how do we get involved in volunteering for lamprey monitoring? So I did put a, the link into our website to where you can sign up for lamprey monitoring. If you're in Connecticut, um, Leslie, you can also do monitoring of the herring and that helps to assess the herring uh, migra migration. Um, so I don't know if we can answer that question. Maybe Bill, uh, maybe Steve. I don't know if, if, if what would be the lowest fish ladder down on the Connecticut. I mean, uh, you could drive up to Holyoke, which wouldn't be too far, but I bet you there are some river herring ladders too that you might be able to visit. Well, Rainbow has um, typically. I would go to the Connecticut DEEP website, and um, it's getting a bit late now, I'm not sure if they have any more open houses, but typically every year they'll have a number of open houses at um, any of their fish ways that they operate. So that that is where I would look. Rainbow is one um, in the past where they've done open houses for public viewing. And that's on, on what tributary? On the Farmington, sorry. Yeah, first dam on the Farmington. And I'll weigh in a little and, and say looking ahead to next year, you know, this, this season is functionally over. Uh, as far as herring and shad passage, uh, at least the water temperature here at Turner's Falls is probably pushing 22 Celsius today. That's that's getting toward the end. But um, looking toward next year, keep an eye out for Migratory Fish Day. World, world is that the right term? World, world migration, right? World Fish Migration Day is that what it is? Yeah, thank you. And and then I expect there will be open houses at many fishways. And then uh, Gary, the question, any timeline for salmon returning as far as Vermont and New Hampshire? I think the expectation is that, you know, there really won't be any salmon returning in any numbers um, up to Vermont and New Hampshire unless they reinitiate the salmon program. Am I, am I right in recalling that um... I don't know, sometime in the past 10 or 15 years ago, or maybe more, there were like salmon that had returned to the White River in Vermont. And was there kind of a, a starting to be a little bit of a return at some point? Or did I just sort of dream that one night, you know? <laughs> um, 2010 or 2011, I, one of those two, years, it was a real banner year for all of New England for salmon. Hmm. Merrimack had record returns. We saw really nice numbers uh, throughout Maine, but it was kind of this one year blip. And uh, really, the, the bulk of the population right now is is returning the Penobscot, and then the population just sort of exponentially declines. As, you know, the the Kennebec and or the Androscoggin. I don't think the Androscoggin has seen any salmon this year. Hmm. Um, Saco, I don't think they've seen any Merrimack. Again, if it, it's either zero, it's it's less than five to zero. I mean, it's it's so we're not talking many fish at all. 
So this isn't something that's um, particular to the Connecticut River. I mean, it's it's just a trend kind of region wide. Um, and and would you say um, it was, is it Melissa? Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm Gary Clark. I live in Vermont. Um, I just uh, is it mostly that the like the up to the states and like Vermont and New Hampshire to kind of actively be sort of seeding the programs to get the runs going? I mean, is that mostly what's inhibiting it or is it just the, the all the obstacles of dams and water temperature and water quality and all that stuff? Or or maybe it's all of that combined that would have to turn around. Yeah. And and yeah. just to take a step back, you know, the Connecticut River population, the, that population, so they have distinct population segments. <clears throat> You know, up in Maine, they're they're federally listed, um, and so they have different genetic strains, right? And 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 the Connecticut, the population was extirpated when they built Holyoke Dam. So what they did is they took a genetic strain from Maine, propagated it, and continued for the next forty years, you know, of stocking out the fry and a lot of time and effort and money to do that kind of work, um, and not seeing the returns. Right. So you know unless things drastically change in terms of, you know, getting rid of barriers and, and, you know, they they just, I just think that it wouldn't come to fruition again. Um, so we have no plans in Vermont to do any sort of salmon um, restoration yeah. moving forward. We're, we're moving on, we're focusing on sea lamprey and eel um, yeah. and shad. Yeah. And I think that, you know, um, thank you for, yeah that it just it, it is um, a multitude of factors as you were alluding to you know the reasons why uh that the connecticut river program was not successful it's not just the freshwater environment you know even if we removed all the dams uh and you know potential predators um competition etc improve water quality there's still the marine environment too right and so it's there's a bunch of issues out there. There's a bunch of issues in the freshwater environment. And, um, you know, we, it does, as Leo said, it, it was um, not an inexpensive program to, um, to continue. And the decision was made that without any kind of um, substantial biological response, you know, it, it was uh, that, that the resources needed to probably be used elsewhere, for example, up in Maine, where it's a federally listed species. Um, it makes sense. And I, I appreciate the reaction. I just, yeah, I hadn't really thought about that in a long time, because it seemed to me um, that I had heard at some point that there was this little signs that maybe we might be breaking through, but that would probably was longer ago than I'm willing to admit right now. It might be, you know, <laughs> when I was in college or something. So um, anyway, well, to that extent, I mean, the, the Connecticut Legacy Program will be interesting to follow and see if they achieve any success with their, you know, particular management strategy. Uh huh. Okay. Hey, folks, I got to go to another meeting. I put in the chat World Fish Migration Day celebration is 52122. Apparently, there's not one this year. Yeah, and, it's only every other year, I think, that okay. they hold those. The 10th river month celebration in Vermont is this month and we're working on some <clears throat> public education outreach and would appreciate any help you folks can give us. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Learned a lot and be safe folks. Thanks Todd. Thanks Todd. So we are running out of time here thank you everyone for um you know for joining us this morning and like um uh, uh, contributing your knowledge and questions and again we have been doing these uh events because we're trying to you know educate everyone really because we are going through this public process with the relicensing of these facilities and we really need the public to comment and um, you know, be, uh, be able to comment on the license and then comment on the clean water certificate process in uh, the states that will occur after, um, uh, you know, after the next year. Um, so we will sign you up on our FERC or hydropower email list to give you updates so you know when the public comment period will open and uh, Andrea and I are glad to you know answer any questions help with those comments um, so 
uh, you know, really calling for help for people to be involved in this public process. Okay, thanks you guys. I have to jump off. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Okay, gotta jump. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Good program. Thank you. Thanks, Steve, for coming. Uh, sorry to uh, take take over the podium. No, it's great. Really helpful to have your expertise. <laughs> Thank you. I, I was, you know, this is for, for anybody that's still on and, and uh, is, Leo must have signed off. Out of curiosity, uh, I contacted Ken a while back because um, we had a salmonid that, that we knew wasn't an Atlantic salmon. But uh, what we're 99% certain it was, was a pretty good sized lake trout. I've never seen that in any of these fishways. Oh, wow. Huh. I don't know where it came from. Huh. Yeah, uh, interesting. Yeah, it's just, a, you know, probably an escapee from somewhere. So just a one-off. But... Yeah, or like if somebody caught something in the, <laughs> the quab and yeah. the bar and dumped it or something, who knows? Yeah. Huh. I, I believe it was 2019 was the last year that there were any salmon through the fishways and they were all believed to be wanderers from the Connecticut program. Uh, at least that was the conclusion. Uh, uh, yeah. And so 2013 was the last uh, the last time that Fish and Wildlife Service did any stocking. And 2017, I think, was the expected, or 2018 was the expected last year of return. So 2019 was a was a surprise. Mm. Yeah. So Sarah, you asked um, access to slides or video. Um, Yes, we are recording this video. Uh, we will send out a thank you note to folks. And do we usually have that link in there, Kathy? Yeah, so we'll, we'll send out a thank you. It'll have the link to this video. It'll have a link to um, a couple other videos that sort of cover the, cover the relicensing in general. Um, and a link to uh, you know more information on our website about how to get involved in the FERC relicensing process there will be too much information in that email trust me <laughs> so you know, your, your nighttime reading <laughs> wanted to see again not have to watch the whole video just email us and we can send it to you great all right thank you everyone all right have a thank good you day. have a Thanks. good day bye